we are getting close to the end of the state's case in chief. We learned that they may rest as early as Tuesday. So after we've had this entire interrogation video that lasted nearly 10 hours, a lot more inside of the courtroom with breaks and pauses, uh, we are going to only hear from a few more witnesses before they wrap up their case. We know they still have the medical examiner to testify about the autopsies in this case and some more to the investigation, but the bulk is already in front of this jury. We know it could have gone longer in terms of prosecution when we believe that this was going to be a capital murder case in terms of the death penalty being on the table, but we knew that it was going to be a shorter prosecution because of that change by the prosecutor's office, taking it off the table, and now a life in prison without parole would be the max that this defendant could face. But today uh, was a huge uh, moment, a huge part of this case for the jury because they heard what the prosecution is really resting their case on, the confession that they say was able to be obtained by the investigators who interrogated this defendant after they caught him brought him into custody take a listen to some of those portions of that interrogation video that dragged on but we were able to pull out those times when he started to talk about what happened These jurors did have a transcript, so they were able to pull out those moments that are sometimes difficult to hear inside of the courtroom. This was certainly the culmination of this multi-day evidence that's been shown on the stand. Uh, there were other portions that were really hard to listen to, especially the description of how he says he killed Janelle Ortiz, his last victim, that he was planning to take his own life during that time is what he told these officers and said that she told him that you don't have to do that. God loves you. God forgives you. She walked away, even though he told her you should leave, that uh, you know I'm not going to hurt you. I'm going to hurt myself. But she walked back. And he told officers that when he feels bad for and he realized that everything was over in that moment because he did shoot her and leave her there in the roadway ultimately telling those officers where her body was found and one of the I think uh, Judge Ashley one of the most difficult things for this pro the defense to overcome in trying to argue that he could have in any way been coerced or perhaps fed information he was able to give them that information that they didn't previously have. All right absolutely and chilling details but having said that I have to to tell you, Julia, when we start watching the cross-examination of the witness through whom these were being introduced, so that's Captain Frederico Calderon, tell me what themes, because I thought the defense attorney was really effective in poking some holes and doing everything he could. Were there any specific themes that you noticed? Attorney Joel Perez was definitely effective and poised in the way that he crossed this investigator. He questioned their practices and their procedure in their communication with this suspect overnight. This was from 3 a.m. till noon the next day that they were in this lengthy uh, 
interrogation inside of that room. You even had a moment where the captain said, look, he'd been up for 30 hours. He said he was sleep deprived in that moment, too. There was a question from the defense about why he didn't have his own report as an investigator, why he didn't write down things as they were happening, and why perhaps they were using different things to induce, he didn't use the word coerce, but induce information out of the suspect, like telling him that they were going to search his home, but they wouldn't be trashing the home. They wouldn't go in the kids' room and disrupt things. They wouldn't break down the door. That they would get him a picture of his wife and children, something this suspect asked for, just so he could hold it and have it. And the defense attorney continued to ask whether these things were used to bargain, to get an answer from this suspect. But they also questioned a uh, part of the reading of the rights and whether there was an issue there. Take a listen. Ranger Salinas says, okay, uh, look, you know there's always two sides to every story. Everybody has problems, you know. So, um, um, and you know that you're, you're in custody right now, uh-huh. Okay, are you waiting, willing to tell us your side of the story as far as what happened or, and Mr. Ortiz answers no. Okay. So, so he asked him literally, in, in other words, do you want to give a statement? And he says no. Do you see that? I see what you're saying, yes. Okay, and so uh, you did not take that as him invoking his right, Fifth Amendment right. Do you see that he's invoking his Fifth Amendment right to remain silent? No, I don't see that. Okay. So, so what you and law enforcement require is, is, it, is it, look, I, I invoke my Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. Is that what's required? No, sir. So if a guy says, no, I don't want to talk, that's not good enough for you? In this case, I didn't take it as him invoking his Fifth Amendment right. So if I, if I go up to you and say, hey, do you want to talk to me? You say, no. No doesn't mean no? It depends on the circumstance. You're making a generalization. In this, in this instance, I didn't take it as a no. The jury was engaged during this cross-examination. Not sure if they were taking a lot of notes during this time, but just the different inflection inside of the courtroom because they have just been hearing from one witness and only hearing the interrogation video. Now seeing this more rapid back and forth between the defense attorney and the investigator certainly perks things up a bit inside of the courtroom. But those are the themes that we're continuing to see through the cross and now pointing more, it seems, towards what the defense case is going to be once things turn over to them next week. And Julia, during the interrogation, one of the things I noticed was that some of the answers would be, you already know that. That's what Ortiz would say in response to how many times did you shoot her, for instance. So tell us a little bit more. We know he was Border Patrol agent, law enforcement. What else do we know about his background? How long did he actually serve as an agent? Well, he'd been with the Border Patrol there in Webb County for about eight years. Uh, this is something that had almost been a life long career for him when it comes to law enforcement and being a public servant or officer because after his 18th birthday is when he enlisted in the Navy and he was there for about eight years rather he was with the Border Patrol for nine years and eight years with the Navy he uh, during that time three years with the first Marine Division and someone that those who knew him those who were close to him just could not believe that he would be someone who could be accused of this kind of a crime they say he was very church going. He was a family man. Suburbia was, you know, that was his persona that they felt was very genuine, that he was someone who also didn't have very few or had very few, if any, infractions during his time as an officer or complaints against him. And so someone who really was under the radar when it came to anyone suspecting that he could be connected in this way, even someone who may have been at 
San Bernardo Road, which was known for having sex workers who were there. Uh, another thing that is interesting and may come out more in this trial is that he, as an intelligence officer, because he was supervisory there with the Border Patrol, mm -hmm. he was approached about these killings and approached about the evidence that officers were looking for and whether or not his agency with the Border Patrol could help them in their search for the killers of Melissa Ramirez and Claudine Luera. So perhaps we'll hear what he was doing and if he covered up anything while he was there really on the side of the law during this investigation. And Julia, one of the things I noted in some of the history you just shared and Adrian and Grace with our Court TV team provided a lot of information. And in March of 2003, when he was deployed and serving in Baghdad, he was ordered to clear some of the city's dangerous streets. I thought that was another really interesting aspect of his work history, given the reason uh, allegedly he decided to shoot the sex workers that he is accused of shooting. Julia Janae, thank you so much for joining us with all the latest there live in Texas.